This is the Only One Shot Golf Podcast. I'm Jim Gallagher, Jr. Special thanks to Steve Azar for allowing us to use his music. You can find Steve at steveazar.com. Don't forget to subscribe to wherever you get your podcast and get your copy of Only One Shot. That's available on Amazon. It was written by VJ Trolio. Today's guest is Charlie Ewing, the head coach of the Mississippi State women's golf team. He was one of our uh, first guests uh, early on in the podcast in season one. You can go back and listen to him uh, when he was the assistant men's coach here at Mississippi State. So good to have him on now. This is his second year as the uh, head coach of the women's team. He's uh, married to Allie Ewing, who's on the LPGA's couple wins, a couple uh, Solheim appearances. So uh, really cool to have him back on, find out how the team's doing, relive uh, last season's great uh, magical run at the SEC, and see what lies ahead for the Mississippi State women's golf team. Let's get Charlie on the line. All right, I've got my good friend Charlie Ewing now, the women's golf coach here at Mississippi State. Uh, it's been a while. You were one of my first victims of this podcast, Charlie. Great to have you out here with me today. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me on. I'm glad to be on again. Uh, I'm hoping this one you treat me a little bit better. I'll be nicer. Time. And this is the barn, right? Is that That's right? right. That's okay. Well, see, I've got good memories from a couple of years ago. Uh, you were the assistant coach here for a while under Dusty Smith. You played golf at Vandy. I did. And I went to Tennessee. Mm-hmm. We can still get along. We can. Uh, you can still pick on me all you want. You played there. You, weren't you a volunteer assistant for a year before you went? Because I'm getting this kind of confused. I think you were a volunteer after you graduated. Uh, and you all went to the NCAA, is correct? That's right. I was the volunteer assistant. My debut in coaching was at the national championship in Eugene, Oregon. Oh. Uh, we finished uh, third in the stroke play, uh, lost the first round of match play. So that was my first taste of, of coaching. Did you? <laughs> so you go from playing to coaching really quick. Did you? Is that is something you wanted to aspire? Did you want to get in the family business? We talked about this earlier, but mm-hmm. uh, is that something you thought you'd want to get into? Uh, I, I, never, I never really thought of anything other than the family business when I was going through school uh, and then it was something that I did for about 13 months and and just quite frankly didn't like it yeah um, and and all through that time of working in the family business I started to realize how much I missed being in the college golf team environment and obviously I knew I couldn't go back and play but um, but I never really had a huge desire to play professionally uh, it was just the team environment that I was uh, so in love with, and I really started to miss it a lot the more I was removed from it. So that's really where my inspiration came to to get back into coaching. And uh, I look back, and I mean, it's been uh, an incredible blessing of how you know, the opportunities worked out with Coach Limbaugh offering me an opportunity to come be a volunteer assistant, and then um, you know Coach Sands, mm. you know, the opportunity gave me at Texas Tech, and then uh, you know Dusty hiring me as the assistant here. I mean, it's it's all uh, it's all amazing how it all worked out, but um, it all it all really was rooted in. Um, being somewhere that, that I thought I wanted to be that ended up not being the best place for me and really kind of revealed that, that passion and love for, for being in a team environment. You know, Kendall Graveman, who's now major league pitcher, was with the mm-hmm. Astros, the World Series, was on the team here at Mississippi State when they went to the College World Series and they got beat in the finals by UCLA. He talked about his college experience, mm-hmm. that that was his most memorable. I said, you pitched in a World Series? He goes, college. Mm-hmm. It was just that he just loved that atmosphere. And he said, you know, to this point, other than family, that's the part that he really uh, cherished. But you mentioned Greg Sands, who's at Texas Tech Hall of Fame coach. What did you learn from him? You know, you worked under Coach – you played for Coach Limbaugh. Then you are sitting there here as assistant for a short period of time. What did you learn from Greg uh, that you were able to take over when you came over here as an assistant for Dusty? The, one of the greatest things that I've, uh, I've noticed about Coach Sands was uh, he coached with incredible humility. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was not afraid to – uh, admit his mistakes to the team and, and apologize to the team for for where he may have uh, made a mistake or fallen short and, and and I just thought that was just it was so easy to gain respect for that mm-hmm. and, and I know you know the a coaching position is always something that people look at is um, it's the you know the big tough guy that's got everything together doesn't make mistakes is kind of that that um, that almost kind of a stereotype that, that's carried around with it, and uh, and he just kind of takes the entire the entirely opposite approach, and and it's just like I'm I'm gonna make mistakes. Uh, he shows incredible care for the people in the program, mm-hmm. the way he's 
Uh, he has incredible relationships with all of his past assistant coaches and former players. I mean, he's just such a relationship guy. And from I've I always noticed that coming from humility more than anything. You know, you we all know there's ought to be a good cop, bad cop. You know, mm-hmm. you know, raising kids and, and that. But it seems like you both had two good cops mm-hmm. uh, there. Because I have, I spent. I, we met at your wedding, and I was like, this guy's really interesting it, uh, you know he's just like charismatic i mean mm-hmm. you see him you sit there and talk to him like i said it's so humble mm-hmm. and then when i had him on the podcast i just could have listened to him for hours mm-hmm. he was just so wonderful to listen mm-hmm. to and i can see why his kids like him mm-hmm. i think that's part of the juggle uh is the assistant they tend to like the assistants mm-hmm. because i guess i don't know there's maybe this because they're the the head coach is just uh, uh top figures kind of like you leave your parents for the first time but you get to come over here dusty brings you over here to mississippi state uh as the assistant, what was that kind of change for you? I mean, kind of a you know new coach. Now he's taken over for the first time. You're in it now. What was it like that first uh, kind of that first experiences coming over here? Uh, I remember a lot of conversations that we had um, early in that in that first semester where we just were really honest with each other, looking at each other, thinking, all right, well, I mean, neither of us really kind of know what we're doing because mm-hmm. he's never been head coach before. I've never been assistant before, so you know, just kind of uh, a lot of trusting our gut and. Um, coming over from Vanderbilt, uh, he he wanted to, uh, of course, he wanted to, to coach in a lot of the way that he's learned that they're really successful. They learned from Coach Limbaugh um, and, and, and um, kind of install a little bit of the blueprint of, of what it looked like to turn around that program at Vanderbilt and, and try to do the same thing here at Mississippi State. But uh, we learned very, very quickly that Mississippi State and Vanderbilt are not the same university. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, that's something that you have to learn through the experience and um, kind of going about it a little bit the hard way of, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of emails and phone calls that go unreturned in the recruiting process, uh, mm-hmm. and, and just kind of having to um, just work from the ground up. And so that was that was one of the big things that we learned here was that uh, there isn't just a blueprint to be successful in college golf. Mm-hmm. You, number one, you have to understand where you are. Um, you know, who, who's going to fit in in that program, uh, which which is very different at Vanderbilt than it is Mississippi State and be very different anywhere on the West Coast or in the sure. Midwest or at different levels. And that was something that we really just had to um, just kind of w- learn by the trial and error. Uh, so that was one of the big things that, that we both learned, especially in new positions, um, just doing that. But uh, it, it, was, it was a really good, uh, a great first opportunity for me. Dusty put an incredible amount of trust in me. I, I, I had a ton of trust and belief in him as a coach and, and really wouldn't want to do it any other way um, mm-hmm. than starting off my, my full-time coaching career for him. It was a true blessing. So you get married to Allie, then McDonald, now Allie mm-hmm. Ewing, uh, playing on the LPGA. What was that first kind of few months like? Because, I mean, that's a tough adjustment. I know I did it when Sissy was playing the LPGA and I was you know, I was playing the PJ Tour. Mm-hmm. What was that adjustment like for both of y'all that first uh, few months? Well, we met uh, on a Tuesday and she left on Saturday for a four-week trip. So, oh, so like it, was, yeah. it was basically we met and then she was gone for four weeks. So it was kind of a, it was a, a, a real, it was, it was a real reality of what, you know, yeah. things were going to be like for, you know, for the next several years and, you know, and now through what, you know, whenever the end of her career will be. But, um, you know, it's definitely a challenge. The, the greatest thing that, that, um, uh, that we've, that we were able to have from the beginning of our, of our relationship and coach Limbaugh, actually, this was some relationship advice he'd given me was just that, you know, as a coach, you have to find somebody that understands and supports the lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And as a professional golfer, um, it takes the same thing from the, you know, the partner of professional right. golfer. You have to understand what that takes. And that was something that we were very fortunate and blessed to have from the get go of, uh, I, although I didn't play pro golf, I know what it takes uh, the investment that a professional golfer has to make in order to be successful, that you're in a different place every single week, you're uh, 26 to 30 weeks on the road a year. Um, and then she understands what the recruiting process is like and how many tournaments we have and the dedication it takes to, um, as a coach, you know, two coaches in one program with, you know, 10 student athletes. You know, there's right. a lot of hands-on that goes with that. So she understands, uh, we, we understand both ways what it, what it takes. So that was something that was good, but that certainly didn't make it easy. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of time spent been a part we've we've gotten to know each other a lot uh over facetime and over the phone yeah, uh, we and, didn't have that right so, <laughs> so uh so that's something that we, we did have phones i'm not saying that <laughs> no it's difficult it's a challenge because uh, you're both wanting to su- be successful you were an assistant then as you is uh, uh for the men's side when you first got married but it is and and jack nicholas's wife barbara had her on the podcast and she said jack said he'd never be gone i think it was no more than two weeks mm-hmm. 
now he had the money to fly around and do the different things and, and, and different kind of job, and she was a stay-at-home mom, but he, he said that, and, and he stayed true to that. And, and I thought that was admirable. He's always been someone I kind of was able to juggle being great at playing and husband and, you know, dad and granddaddy and all that stuff. He, he did a wonderful job of that. And it takes an understanding by both sides. Uh, and, and to be great at anything professionally, you got to be a little selfish. That's mm-hmm. the hard part. That's right. the adjustment uh, that I think any of, for, like my wife, Sissy, was a great player, still is a good player, but that adjustment that I was a pain because mm-hmm. I wanted to be great and I had to be, you know, we talk about it now that I'm kind of retired and it's like, mm, God, I had to be awful to be with, you know, at times because that's, you know, kind of the mentality uh, we took and I kind of, that's part of the, the challenge and the juggle. But December 2nd, 2020, mm-hmm. you become the women's head coach. Right. Did you ever see coaching women as part of the? And not, I'm not. This is not. This is. Did you see that in your future? Did you ever see that happening? I never did, uh, and I can I can say that I can honestly say that uh, Allie being in my life um, and her being such a big part of my life and every decision that I make is. Uh, is the difference in whether or not that coaching women would would have been something right. that I pursued? Uh, because I I tend to hesitate um, from jumping or diving into something entirely unknown. Mm-hmm. And I know that coach on the men's side and the women's side are gonna are gonna you know, really carry a lot of uh, a lot of differences. But um, her encouragement, um, her being able to answer a lot of questions, being familiar with the program, obviously you know playing college golf. Uh, you know that that was able to to really clear up a lot of things, and she knows you know she's known a lot of players mm-hmm. on, on this team, and uh, and I was able to really lean on a lot of different uh, coaches, but m- mostly on Allie to to make sure that I had a genuine understanding of what of what I might experience come over to the women's side, and and really what I found is that it's actually a lot more similar than than what I thought it might be. Right, uh, and that's what a lot of people. All I heard was um, you know how great it is, how fun it is. Um, obviously, you know you can you recruit great people and and really enjoy the enjoy the process make some fantastic relationships and um and then of course golf is golf so, right so if you can coach golf then then you can you know that's a consistency so uh, but uh, i i never really envisioned it um you know in, in the long term but then the opportunity came up and i was fortunate to have great people around me to give me some some great advice and you were around a lot of these players too right is, is them, and i knew they always liked you then so that made it that made the adjustment probably a lot easier what were the differences what are the differences coaching Women. I've talked to Garrett Runyon, who was a men's assistant at LSU. Now he's the women's coach, and he coached my daughter Kathleen that last year. There are adjustments the way the guys play, the way the girl. I talked to <clears throat> being a girl dad. I kind of understand it. Is they're more willing to listen, mm-hmm. and they're like sponges. They want to mm-hmm. listen, and they're. I'm not saying they're more fun, but yeah, they're more fun to coach. Uh, the just as a girl dad, but I mean, I think it's they're willing to listen more uh and they're not always exposed to some of the instruction that some mm-hmm. of the guys were especially when they get to the lpga talking to several of the coaches and teachers out there it's just different but what are some of the differences or adjustments you had to make when you leave the guy's side mid-season now mm-hmm. and now you start coaching those women the first few weeks and months yeah the, uh, one of the big uh from a golf standpoint um the big thing that i noticed was just how much impact that the speed has on the game and spin uh, mm-hmm. So, um, speed is obviously you know you know uh, distance and, right. and, and that and that changes things, but also inf- impacts spin so much to where the guys ha- create more spin. The ball goes a little bit more offline, uh, mm-hmm. a little bit more often, mm-hmm. and then also there's that ability to bail out when you when you hit it offline. So hitting heroic big uh, big slices, big big draws uh, to bail yourself out of a situation you might have gotten into. Okay. Where I think the women's game uh, takes uh, a better mind to think your way around the golf course. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think you have to the uh, creating less spin on the ball means that. Uh, approaching from angles is, is a little bit more important. I think you uh, you have a little bit less ability to bail yourself out from whether it's the rough or the trees. Uh, it's, it's that much more important to make sure that you're positioning yourself around the golf course the right way. They don't miss many shots offline. Right. The, mm-hmm. And I, I know that from the LPGA. I know it from watching. They just, like you said, they hit it straighter. They don't get mm-hmm. offline. They get in more trouble in those trouble areas, hitting those different types of shots. Mm-hmm. You know, as my sister played the LPGA and all the – they always talk about a strength issue around the greens. And it doesn't mean that they can't hold the club. It's a spin. It's mm-hmm. keeping the club face mm-hmm. square. I think that's mm-hmm. over time it gets better. But I think that's one of the differences in the men and the women. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and they work out. Mm-hmm. I mean, y'all work out I don't, 
three or four times a week, maybe five times a week. And that's changed so much from even when I played. Uh, and, and, and to get the right workout person is so important that understands golf. Mm -hmm. And I know you all have that in, in all the schools. That's the great thing about the SEC and uh, all the colleges have those abilities to do it but it's a job mm -hmm. right. it's a job i mean i'm the, I, I don't know if I, i'd had a hard time doing that but you take over mid-season uh and, and you go y'all get to the secs and you get kind of on a little magic ride down in uh over in birmingham uh i think y'all shoot 15 under i think lsu shot a zillion under mm -hmm. in their stroke play but then you beat lsu and Ole miss who were four and five in the country at that time what kind of changed that week the girls just kind of seemed like they had a great attitude and they just thought they could do it. I mean, what was the big difference there? Uh, not that you weren't doing that well in the spring, to, to come in there and just have a great week uh, to get to the finals. I saw an incredible amount of ownership that the team took of, of taking the right mindset into, into the week. Um, uh, just to you know, be frank, the, there were a lot of tournaments in the springtime that seemed like we showed up with the intention of beating some teams mm -hmm. and, and hopefully <clears throat> finishing in the top half of the field. And then for some reason, this you know, uh, um, success in the conference tournament was something that the team wanted really, really badly, mm -hmm. and they wanted it so badly that it changed the way that they prepared and they worked, and and then also it changed the way that um, that they thought about you know their goals going into the week. So it, all of a sudden, it wasn't a let's just go you know, play respectably. Right. It's let's go do our job because we want to win this golf tournament. And that just takes your mindset to a different level of, you know, it, it, you, know you can kind of look at it as uh, if you have a, a professional golfer that's trying to win the U.S. Open, if they genuinely want to win the U.S. Open, it's going to take a little bit different work mm -hmm. than it's going to take to um, just to earn your card on or, right. or to, you know, to compete on a mini tour or something like that. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it's different mentality. It's a different mentality. Yeah. And, and if you genuinely want to win a U.S. Open, then, I mean, that's going to raise the bar on everything. And I saw our team finally take that big step of, of uh, really wanting to win the conference championship golf tournament. And uh, we prepared really well going into it because of it. Um, and at the golf tournament, there was nothing but belief that uh, we could do our job in the stroke play rounds to earn our spot, to earn our tee time um, in that first round of match play. And in the first round of match play, everybody understood that their job was to take care of their opponent. Mm -hmm. and, if you, and if we do that three out of five, then we earn another opportunity to face another opponent. And, and there was just never a lack of belief that, that the team was there to do that and that we could do that um, versus just being good enough and you know and, and just finishing respectably just the mindset yeah that's up. every coach says that i mean i asked mm -hmm. ryan hibble what would you tell the guys do your job take care of your business mm -hmm. that's true mm -hmm. uh and i always tell the kids i mean one shot means so much you may not think it does uh but you go you walk off that golf course that i did everything i could mm -hmm. i don't i was prepared Biggest thing is when you go into it, for me, if, if you're not prepared, you know you're not prepared. Mm -hmm. Like when these kids go over and study for a final. They know they did study, right. but they know when they <laughs> did study. Uh, and you're prepared. I think that helps. I saw a team, just in the, and I wasn't out here as much with them, that looked relaxed, that looked like they believed. And then they go up against Auburn, who's a very good team, finished second. But what a great finish. Mm -hmm. uh, did so much for the program, did so much for the kids. They looked like they were a completely different group than they were in the fall. And they learned a lot about themselves. Uh, you know that when you look back at that first year, and, and what do you what do you take out of that first year for them? What, what's the biggest What's the biggest improvement they made uh, after that first year? Or I guess it's really your second. You just had the ha ha the second half. But what was the biggest thing you saw in that team improvement they made? I thought the biggest improvement kind of goes back to that mindset. But uh, the the team started to identify what they really wanted. Mm -hmm. And when you truly identify what you want, then you start the actions start to follow. Um, and you know there was definitely a point there where I think the team it, it sounds great to, to yeah. want to win a championship and it's easy to say that but the actions really started to follow when the team was like no I really want that I really and they want truly to, believe to, they could right yeah and, and if you want something you believe you can have it then the actions are going to follow so that was something that that was really important that that I noticed the team took ownership of was really identifying. This is what we truly want, mm -hmm. and, and and that's championships. And um, if you truly deep down want those things, then you're going to do what it takes to get there, and also you're going to um, hopefully embody that mindset that, that's required to, to accomplish those things. So that's the biggest thing that that I've certainly you know, looked back and um, and noticed about that team was was finally uh, identifying that and and 
embodying that mindset that it's really going to require to to get there because they believe that it's something that's uh, within reach. Yeah, I think that's the thing. It's it's, it's buying kids buying into that belief. Mm-hmm. They can talk it, but they got to truly believe it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's and you can't have too many expectations because they can be strangling uh, if you're not careful. Mm-hmm. So it's just you got to you got to put the time in. And there's so many good teams, mm-hmm. but right. you were finally getting to do face to face recruiting. Right. You weren't able to do it on the men's side. Now you're recruiting on the women's side. Mm-hmm. What, what were the differences in recruiting the women? What, what have you changed now that you're the head coach when you were recruiting the guys? What are you looking for maybe for the kids that are listening to or the parents that are listening to this? What are you looking for now for someone you want to play here at Mississippi State on the women's side? What are you, what are you looking for when you're out there recruiting? You know, not, not a whole lot has changed. I still have my same you know, core fundamental beliefs um, for what's going to make a successful college golfer that carry over from the men's side to the women's side. I think uh, obviously the way that's, that the game's going, I don't think there's any secret that that power is really important. Um, mm-hmm. Now, power's not everything, right? Uh, but 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 definitely that that's something that's important. So somebody that has the the athletic ability to um, to compress the golf ball is something that that you see carries a lot of. Uh, it carries a lot of importance through the college game and even into the LPGA. Uh, one of the big things that, that we look at is, is this, does this young golfer look like somebody that, um, that has the potential to play at the LPGA level? Do you, you know, look at like kids who play other sports? Uh, uh, playing other sports is, is great. Because I want to hit that because I know a lot of coaches, that's a big plus. That, I know you're a baseball coach at Vandy. That's a big thing for him. He mm-hmm. wants kids that play. When you were at Vandy, mm-hmm. he wanted kids that played other sports. Yeah. You yes. believe that as well. Absolutely. I think I think being a multi-sport athlete is great for hand-eye coordination. I think it's great for uh, for your passion for the game of golf. Uh, because if you're all golf from you know eight years old through high school, at, at what point are you going to be Are you going to be tired of it? I think it's mm-hmm. great to balance your time between golf and basketball and soccer or whatever it might be uh, that's definitely something that, that it seems like it it do, does a lot for the physical side of the game of just carrying athleticism into the game of golf because it is a sport and you see athletes having a lot of success but also for the passion uh, that you have for the game that it's not what you've spent every single day on for the last you know from year from eight years old to 18 mm-hmm. years old it's something that you really want to start spending every and you day wake on. up every morning excited to go out and do it right yeah right. so you got you got people from all over the country, our friends in Canada that, that listen. And what do you tell them to do maybe in the off season? What advice do you have for those kids in the off season? They may be playing basketball. They may be playing hockey, wherever they're doing. But what do they, to keep their game sharp, what do you advise them to do this time of season? We're starting here in Mississippi. We can play pretty much year round. Mm-hmm. But they're starting to kind of, you know, maybe the snow's still up here. What do you advise those kids that are in different parts of the world? How do they stay sharp? Uh, fundamentals are incredibly important. So identifying those key fundamentals of every part of the game that uh, I, I'm setting myself up to perform well if I if I can check these boxes from a fundamental basis. So uh, setup, alignment, uh, grip, you know, those sorts of things are, are really, really important. And, and those are things that you can keep an eye on um, through the winter months, whether, mm-hmm. you know, if you're, if you have six feet of snow outside and there's no access to a golf course, you know, those are things you can check in the living room, or your bedroom or the garage or something like don't that. Don't you think we get too caught up in our golf swings and our strokes and don't do the fundamentals? Right. Absolutely. We don't start with our base. Right. Yeah. The fundamentals are, are so key. And, and that's something that we've even, um, you do that here at the college level too. You keep an eye on that. We do. Yeah. So we, we really try to put an emphasis on the fundamentals. Cause I think that's something that, that gets lost and everybody's trying to find that difference between college players and the LPGA okay. um, or the um, you know the, or the the Corn Ferry Tour and the PGA Tour players mm-hmm. what's the difference there but uh, fundamentals are a huge huge piece of that and, and who's able to just get the simple up and downs around the green who's able to have a, a really good fundamental stroke that just allows the ball to start off online so you can make six you know putt six feet in. is that one of the things because you, you've seen the LPGA at the top level mm-hmm. is that one of the differences you see college level Absolutely, yeah. The, the the fundamentals from the college level to the LPGA, um, and, and it's not necessarily the always just the physical fundamentals, but I think, but it's the fundamentals of of being really sharp in the parts of the game that are more simple, not necessarily easy, but definitely more simple mm-hmm. of uh, making short putts, putting with good speed, um, making sure that you know you're thinking your way around the golf course the right way, so you're eliminating those penalty strokes that are unnecessary. You know those sorts of fundamentals of the game. They got shot link on the PGA Tour. KPMG. Has- 
guys are stats. How do you guys keep stats, or how do you guys keep your y'all keep your stats here at the college level at Mississippi State? We do keep stats. We use a system called Game Forge. Okay. Um, Game Forge does a good job of uh, really breaking things down and giving you an idea of uh, where you're losing shots, gaining shots, mm -hmm. um, and we have our players put them in after qualifying rounds and after really uh, okay. after tournament rounds, so we can really try to gather as much uh, as much data as we possibly can. Man, the game's changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just had to figure it out, mm -hmm. screw up, and good try to figure it out. Mm -hmm. It is. It's it's not science, but it really it's simplified. Uh, but it has changed a lot. I think it's great. I think that's why you see so many great kids from all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why college players are better than when I was in college. That's why the pros are better. Mm -hmm. It's just the instruction, the information that's out there. They understand the information. Uh, it's just it's still you got to get the ball in the hole, but still that's available to them. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you guys go into the fall. Uh, this past fall, how would you rate the fall season for y'all? The fall, the fall was uh, a struggle. We we played better through the semester, and we started okay. to play our better our better golf in the semester was towards the end of the fall. Um, so it, it was um, it was definitely a little bit tougher early on. Now we we did have um, a freshman come in, win her first golf tournament in the fall, which, right. which was really cool. That was a really special week, and and I know something that she was really excited about coming from Spain to the United States. Uh, she'd never visited the United States before. Really? And uh, so she comes to the wow. U.S. And, and just a few weeks later, she... Oh, she I think I'll win. Tournament. Right. <laughs> right. She, uh, she uh, set um, program record, and then uh, she broke it um, at the beginning of the spring semester. I was going to say, so, yeah, she just did it again. And uh, she shot impressive. nine under the final round. So she, she had a, a great start. So that was definitely a highlight to the early part of the of the semester. And then uh, towards the end of the semester, you know, we, we worked through our uh, worked through our kinks, worked through our struggles, and, and started to play some better golf there at the end of the fall and, and felt like that that's helped us get off to a good You know, John Fields made an interesting comment to me. We were talking about Texas men, and they got a great team. And they're probably – there's five or six or eight men's team, but he's you know they were the favorite and they lost to Cootie Boys for a little bit. He said that his team never plays good early because they've played all summer long. Mm -hmm. And I thought it would have been the opposite that they would have been prepared. He goes, no, they're burned out. They just finished mm -hmm. the USAM. It's probably the same for the women. Mm -hmm. uh, adjusting to college, adjusting to school, coming in there, they kind of figure it all out. Freshmen especially coming in, they figure it out by the end of the semester. But like you said, you had a great start uh, to spring. Uh, would y'all do kind of because the weather is pretty crummy here in January? Would y'all do to kind of stay sharp? I mean, you got the indoor facility, but would you do to stay sharp just this, to get ready for that first event? Uh, honestly, if uh, if the greens are uncovered, then then we go out and play. No uh, matter what, and that's and that's something that that we've really um, stuck stuck uh, pretty. Um, you know, we've been really committed to that approach, and um, you know, we, we've we want to get out there and, and play in challenging conditions, just because we feel it play, it's going to prepare us really well. So, so we like to get on the course, and if it's cold, if it's windy, it's wet or raining, you, you know, we want right. to get out there and play. Well, they got to be prepared for that, right? I think it, you know we talked about that. I mean, it was uh, Danielle Kang. The butch made her go out in the cold mm -hmm. weather, the wind, yep. to be prepared for it, and it paid off for it. Just saw your wife try to break in. Let's go back to her. I was actually, it was weird. I was in uh, Baton Rouge with Kathleen cleaning the, I was power washing the driveway, and I get a call, can you get to, you know, east of Atlanta to do the LPGA event? I said, sure. Uh, and lo and behold, Allie's in contention. Her mom and dad were there. You weren't there. I think, I don't know if you were at the tournament mm -hmm. or whatever. But I was actually on the call, which was pretty cool, knowing that I'd known her since she's a kid, mm -hmm. to see her get that first win. That was mm -hmm. pretty special. Mm -hmm. uh, what was it like not being there watching? Because that has to be hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was terrible watching kids play uh, when I wasn't on site. What was it like for you? Uh, it was it was tough uh, because we were we were in Franklin, Tennessee at um, at a at a golf tournament. Right. I was coaching on the men's side at the time, and uh, that's and, right. And uh, it was her birthday. So she, right. she wins on her birthday. Her, it was the first tournament that her parents were able to go to that entire yep, year because of it was, COVID. It was 2020 because of COVID. So um, it was tough, but uh, but we finished our round, and I was able to pull up the uh, the end of the the tournament on my phone and watch it sitting down on the. Was on it the freaking you out? It was. I mean, she had control. <laughs> I, I've always trusted her a heck of a lot more with her golf game than I ever trusted myself with mine. <laughs> so, so there was way more peace watching her play and go through that than, than I ever had when I was in, um, in you know, maybe in contention for an amateur tournament or, or a college right. tournament. So uh, I, I definitely had a sense of peace about it, but um, she handled it very well. Her composure she did. is definitely the strength of, is one of the strengths of her game. Uh, so she looks like she's got it under control. That helps me handle it a lot better. Well, I asked the kids, and I was just, I said, was I... 
how did I sound? Did I sound like, I think one of them said, sound like you were pulling from Daniel Kang. <laughs> I said, no, I was just making sure I wasn't too pro. You know, Ali, I mean, it just was like, I could sense everything. And then, you know, Daniel almost makes it on the last hole. But uh, you got out to Vegas and it's your anniversary week. That's right. And lo and behold, she wins again. But you're on site. That's right. That had to be pretty cool. That was really special. I, I, I didn't, sh- I showed up on the second day. Uh, okay. So it was during the pool play. And, and, uh, and and I was going to caddy the next week for Abby Daniel at the U.S. Open, and Allie was going out there. So it it it, it was a two week period where Allie and I were going to actually spend some time together, and um, and it happened to be our first anniversary. And so it all, everything just worked out from a timing standpoint, just just really really well. But the the week of watching her play match play was was really special, and uh, and then getting to the weekend, and um, again she she plays Daniel because that was a long week, long week. She yeah. played. Seven matches over the course of five days. Wow! And um, then she plays uh, Danielle Kang in the quarterfinal. Right. Who um, you know she's she's hometown of you yep. know, in Vegas and and obviously you know a, an unbelievably tough competitor regardless of the circumstances. And they had an incredible match and um, you know they're hole and putts. Allie hold a bunker shot yep. in one hole and uh, and then and then the next morning uh, she plays Arya Jutan Yeah. Uh, and then uh, and then Sofia Popov in the final and, and you could just tell that. Uh, in that final match between Allie and they Sophia. They were both tired. They were exhausted. Yeah. And they're both playing good golf, but you can yeah. see it's exhausting yeah. good golf. Mentally, and, physically, and, yeah. And um, and just at the end of that week, um, you know, she, she was just she was just exhausted. And then the, yeah, there were some um, celebratory festivities that they had set up for her and um, and that took us, you know, a, you know, a little bit deep into the night and, and uh, so we were so yeah. we were up late that night and the next morning to fly over to the US Open and, and uh, I can I can promise you that the way that she went through those three practice days in San Francisco leading up to the US Open are probably different than she's ever yeah. you know, prepared for a golf tournament yeah. just because of how exhausting it was. she was. But it was but of course you know, we wouldn't change a thing for She her. said she's looking for another anniversary to win another one. I don't know what it would do. <laughs> Every tournament she plays we're trying to find some sort of holiday on that final round. <laughs> that's what she tells me all the time but that's that's, that's that was such a cool moment. Uh, and I remember it was one of my grandsons was watching it on the video and I sent it to Allie and he was saying, Allie, make the putt. And you know, it was pretty, it was cute as can be and, mm-hmm. and watching all that. But, you know, I, I talked to several coaches. I don't know if it's happened here, but we got a lot of kids. A lot of the ladies want to go to Q school in the fall. And a lot of them turn pro in the middle of the season. That's got to be difficult. You, you want to bring the best players in. And I've talked to Dan Brooks and I've talked to several of them about it. You want your best players to be there and you can't keep them from doing it. But that's a challenge. I would like to see them do something like a PGA Tour U. Right. Uh, something like that. Have you had any thoughts on that or any kind of a – what's your opinion on that? Maybe is there something like that or some idea we could do? Because it's got to be hard for you coaches knowing you want them to stay, but in the middle of the year, there's got to be a better way than there is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, I think a, a – LPGA Tour U would be right. a, just a phenomenal idea. It, it'd be really, really good for the game. And, the, and one of the reasons that you see how how much of an impact those players are having on the on the main yeah. side, it, it shows that those players are ready to play at the PGA Tour level. I mean, give them that, some Symmetra status, right? You know, give them. I've had a couple companies talk to me about maybe want to sponsor a two or three event that would get them an exemption here or there, but something like that would give them status and, and gave them a reason. I understand because if you don't finish in that top 20 in a Q school, there's no reason to turn pro till mm-hmm. basically May. You might as well mm-hmm. defer because uh, you're not going to get in anything anyway. That's the problem for the kids, I think, if they turn pro. They want to do it. Hey, I got my LPGA card, but I finished 30-something. and They're not going to get in. Mm-hmm. So now where do you got to play because you stay sharp? Right. Uh, Symmetra has a few more events early on, but there's got to be a better way of doing that, both for coaches and players. And, and I, I get it, but uh, I think that's a tough part. And, uh, and, and one thing that, that is I don't think anybody can dispute is that the best players in college golf, both on the men's side and the women's side, they're, they're amongst the best players in the world. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and, and you see that, uh, that players are having such an immediate impact um, on on the tour once they once they leave college. I mean, there's even some that while they're in college have have good finishes professional tournaments. Sure. And so I, I really don't think there's any any argument that says that those players don't deserve it because they are amongst the best players in the world uh, and they're able to, to show that and prove that pretty consistently year after year. Um, gosh, um, Sahith Theology just almost yeah. won the, the waste management. This and he was the best 
best. He was the he was the best college player that one right. year. He was just in college. You know, it feels like yesterday. So uh, you have really good players at the collegiate level that are ready for that tour of golf, and I think it'd be a great way to reward that college play. And, and also, they keep in all those four years. I think right. that's the incentive, and mm-hmm. I, and it's good for you guys. It's good for them to get their degrees. Get because pr- to me, pro golf's always going to be out there, right? On both sides, there's no guarantees you're going to make it, and you need to come. You need to kind of learn to grow. As an 18, 22-year-old. I mean, I, there's very few Jordan Spieths. There's very few uh, Tiger Woods. Or there's very few, but you see a lot of these LPGA, you know, the, the Cordes sisters that come out early. There's, there's very few of them. That college experience prepares them to travel, the whole thing. Because I think for a lot of these kids, all of a sudden, when they get out of college, or even when they've had, they've had people doing everything now, all of a sudden they're on the LPGA or PGA Tour by themselves. It's an adjustment. Right. I think college really getting those four years would be huge. You know, the spring's coming up. What are the? I, I hate to use the word expectation. What are some of the goals? Where are y'all playing that next? Uh, we're going to Arizona, playing the Westbrook. Okay. Uh, and then we'll turn around pretty quickly and play in the in the Florida Gator. Uh, okay. So those are our next two tournaments coming up. After that, we'll play Liz Murphy in Athens, Georgia, and then okay. they'll take us into the conference tournament, and uh, and then hopefully uh, have uh, some tea times in the postseason. Do you? I talked to a few coaches. They like to go different parts of the country in case mm-hmm. you have to go out there in the regionals. Mm-hmm. Say you, you know, the Southern team gets to go has to go to Michigan. Never played right. on bent in their life. Right. I mean, I think a lot of teams I saw change their schedules. Are y'all? contemplating doing that or maybe doing a little mix up more mix up as time goes on yeah i really really like to to play a broad schedule uh in the fall we're we're going to uh pebble beach to start our year how good is that it's going to be amazing yeah I, mean, I, I played in that tournament and then i coached in that tournament and now it's moved over to a women's tournament so i'm just i'm the benefit i'm the biggest beneficiary of the carmel cup that's for sure <laughs> well the cool thing is it's a great recruiting tool right and we're on and we the golf channel we do a lot of events how much has that helped in recruiting it's it's great because it Playing a great schedule is part of developing, mm-hmm. and I think players want to understand that when they're coming to um, to Mississippi State, that they're that they're not just going to be playing in Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, right. um, and playing similar golf courses right. uh, on a, you know, that consistently. So, so we really try to 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 play all over the country. We went to Chicago in the fall, um, got to play some um, you know bent grass up there. So you did do that, okay? That's we good. Did that. yeah. We'll uh, we'll go to Florida, and you get that. You, know, you see a little bit more grain in mm-hmm. Bermuda, mm-hmm. Uh, but then you know, we'll go to Arizona, get us a uh, you know some desert golf, and also hopefully some, some prep- preparation for uh, national championships. So so we try to uh, do as, as broad of a of a schedule as we possibly can. Yeah, because I, I felt like when I was doing the NCAA's that being an Arizona team or a desert team, and you've played in it, it's a it's different golf, right? It's a different look. It's a different. I mean, the grasses are usually kind of making that transition, but it's a whole different look. Right. No different than kids that come down and bent get on Bermuda and vice versa. Uh, I think it's so smart to do that because we always played regional, regionally, and that's kind of how they picked it back when we were in college. But I see a lot more teams going under. I was talking to a few guys. I guess if they leave the country, it doesn't count against you. How many days are y'all allowed to play tournament golf and be away from school? How many days are y'all in the season allowed? We're allowed to have 24 competition 24 days, days, but, it, but it's uh, – it's it's per player. Um, okay. So, so if there's a player that doesn't play every tournament for the team, then that gives them an opportunity to go play maybe as an individual gotcha. in another tournament. So, um, so it's it's 24 total competition days, and sometimes uh, if you have a 36 whole day, that just counts as one day. Versus, okay. So it's just uh, the actual day. Right. So that's good. Uh, there's 18, 18, 18 tournaments that counts as three days. How tough is it to do those 36 whole days for the? For the team, I mean, I know I'd want to have a cart that second one. I know that because <laughs> uh, you got daylight, you got all those other issues. But I mean, do you? How many of those do y'all play in? Uh, we we try to play more of the 18, 18, 18s. Mm-hmm. Um, now this year we have a handful of the thirty six, eighteens. But it's something that. Uh, We'd like to play more on the of the three day tournaments, yeah. but but you know they're good for you. It, it it really starts to show that you know the importance of those of those workouts that you do, and um, you can see that long, the the stamina that you that you build up from that. It, you know, it really it really plays a role. But uh, what we've seen is that um, some of our our players, if if they get off to a good start on that first day, that it allows them to to really carry a lot of that momentum throughout the entire thirty six holes. So, right. So it can be a really good thing, but also it gives you an opportunity to if you don't get off to a great start you have a lot of time to really pick yourself back up and and flip things do your workouts change like in season versus off season 
They do. They do. So in season, uh, our, our strength staff does a really, really good job of staying on top of our schedule and making sure that the workouts we do are going to allow us to be uh, in the best day to perform in whatever we have coming up, right. whether it's a tournament or qualifying. When we're in the off season, uh, then it's a lot more about really um, you know, kind of pushing your body to a limit to really um, achieve a lot of um, you know, to, to really see, see like you're gaining a lot mm-hmm. of strength and, and mobility in a lot of ways. So you, so it might be a little bit more. Um, it might be a little bit harder on your body from the sense that, that you're going to be more tired and you can be more sore in right. the off season. Uh, of course, always you know, health and safety is going to be the priority right. of everything that we do. But but in season, we definitely uh, we definitely monitor the schedule and, and change things up depending on where we are in, in the season. It's a job. You're doing a great job. I appreciate you. you being with us. I know your wife wants to go out there and make you practice. Now, is it true you have you, you don't like to change the tees? You want to play from the same tees? Mm-hmm. Is that true? Yeah. So, so I'll, come on now. I'll, you I'll, hit the I'll, ball. Come on now. I'll leave you with a story. So, so the first time Allie and I ever played together, uh, we played at Mossy Oak and played the front nine. Yeah. And, and I was, you know, of course, I had to be a little bit macho, and I was like, well, I'm going, I'm going all the way back. I'm tipping it out. Big mistake. I'm going to hit bombs. And uh, we get to number nine, and uh, Allie and I are tied. I was, I, it was probably the round of my life. I was uh-huh. even par. I <laughs> got pretty good for the back And, and, uh, and uh, we get to number nine, and she hits it to a foot, and, uh, and I hole it on top of her. No, you don't. So, so I make a hole in one, and I beat her for the first time. So I'm 1-0 against her in my lifetime. Did you quit and never play uh, her again, did you? Second time we go out and play. <laughs> of course, of course, I'm unbeatable at this point. No, of course point. you are. You walk on water. And uh, we get to the eighth hole that day, and she's got me about... 15 down or yeah. something, you know, something like that. And I'm, and I just can't even, I just can't even handle it. And I finally, I tell her, Allie, I was like, I think it's better that we play with each other and not against each other. Yes. And she goes, I didn't even know we were playing against each other. So, <laughs> so, uh, so that, that tells you, um, kind of how our golf game is now. It's just go play. Now I can promise you if I'm, if we get to the last couple holes and I'm beating her, now we're playing against each other. Oh, of course so, you so, I, Anyone so. that knows Allie McDonald Ewing or whatever, uh, we knew her as Allie McDonald, uh-huh. and she's even more competitive than Allie. That's, right. So, uh, that's right. That's a great way to end it. Appreciate you spending some time with us, mm-hmm. and good luck to the uh, – y'all bulldogs or lady bulldogs? How do y'all call yourselves? We're the bulldogs. Okay. There you go. All right, we'll, we'll cut that for, part out. Thanks for having me on. All right, buddy. Thank you. What were you thinking on that play? Take a lap, and when you come back, maybe you'll do things my